Um, I'm really delighted to be here today and to be talking to you about Walter Benjamin's Ethics of Study. Um, I want to start by saying a little bit about my title. Um, so when I'm referring to Benjamin's ethics, I'm referring to ethics as an ethos or as a way of life. And I want to argue that his intervention in the meta-educational thought of the German tradition is to excavate a form of life that's particular to study, which comes to the fore in the title of his valedictory address to the student movement, the life of students. Um, so what we'll be investigating today is how starting from the standpoint of student life changes our idea of the university. And here we have an image of Walter Benjamin in the Paris Library and an image of the van der Vogel. And these images are meant to be a little bit incongruous, a little bit dissonant. Um, Benjamin's own friends had a really hard time imagining him as a student leader in the reform movement. Um, and certainly for us, for our retrospective gaze, it's really hard not to read these images without having in mind their very, th their divergent historical ends, which is to say that the van der Vogel um, would become the Hitler youth and Benjamin would um, take his own life at the Franco-Spanish border in 1940. Um, so from the beginning, we have the problem of violence and violence in education on the horizon here. Um, so I want to give you a little bit of context for the youth movement or the student movement. Um, it took place in Germany from around the turn of the century to 1938. So it encompasses um, the Wilhelmin Empire, the Weimar Republic, and the Third Reich. Um, Benjamin's involvement in it was comparatively brief. So he was an active member and student leader between <laughs> 1911 and 1914. Um, so as some of you probably know, the youth movement was quite heterogeneous um, politically, socially, and ideologically. Um, it had various factions spanning from like a German Jewish socialist left to um, an ethno-nationalist right. Um, Benjamin himself was um, a leading voice of the Freiburg direction, which was a group of students who espoused principles they'd taken from um, a radical co-educational pedagogue named Gustav Beineken, who was drawing heavily on romantic and Nietzschean ideas. Um, and so their basic idea is that student life involves a practical and theoretical orientation specific to students and non-aligned with um, existing political parties, political programs, or identity-based groups. And as you've taken note out from the title, Benjamin studied at Freiburg and Berlin. Um, so two points here, I guess. The first is that he broke with the student movement around the outbreak of the First World War. And he worked specifically with Weineken, who'd been his mentor in the movement, over Weineken's um, public support for the, cons the conscription of youth into the war. He saw this as basically consigning his generation to sacrifice their lives on the battlefield for the sake of the German nation. So the question of state power and militarism and the autonomy of youth um, is at the crux of his break with the movement itself. Returning to this question of study as an ethos or study as a form of work, um, Benjamin's claim is going to be that the, the orthodox definition of academic freedom as the freedom of the professor to teach what they want to and publish what they want to isn't a sufficient guarantee for freedom in the university. Um, so in the German tradition, there are sort of two poles to the idea of academic freedom. There's on the one hand, Lehrfreiheit, or this, the professorial freedom that I've been discussing, and on the other hand, uh, Lehrenfreiheit, or the freedom of the student to learn. And Benjamin will be emphasizing this latter pole, and will be claiming specifically that in committing yourself to a particular idea in your studies, or committing yourself to a particular direction of studies, you're also committing yourself to a particular form of life and it's the right to this form of life that he wants to defend. I'm going to be relating his essay on the life of students to a piece he wrote six years later called The Critique of Violence. Um, this is a, like, a really dense and difficult essay and there's been a lot of commentary on it that doesn't necessarily like, 
resolve itself into a consensus about what he is saying. Um, so I just have this, this table up here to simplify things a little bit for us. What I want to emphasize is I think that there's a structural analysis here of the role of violence in the legal system. And that's kind of the principal claim Benjamin is making is that the making of law or the constituting of a legal system is violent and it establishes the monopoly of the state on violence and only includes individuals within the sphere of rights on the basis of their nonviolence. So what he's tracking is a kind of interplay between law making violence, so the violence that constitutes the law, and law preserving violence, so the violence that maintains the law and in fact serves to extend its domain. So we can think here of the way that police brutality often under the guise of enforcing the law um, extends the purview of the law to people who have not actually committed an infraction. So over against this closed system of law, Benjamin wants to highlight what he calls sovereign violence. So the right of the sovereign to suspend the system of law on the basis of his own authority. The privileged example of sovereign violence in the scholarship has been the proletarian general strike. So here we have this a block quote in which he describes the proletarian general strike, um, and I'm going to read to you from the bold-faced part. So, okay, I guess the contrasted issue here is, been the, is between the political general strike, which he regards as reformist, and the proletarian general strike, which he regards as truly revolutionary. Um, so whereas the first form of disruption of work is violent, since it causes only an external modification of labor conditions, the second, as a pure means, is nonviolent. For it takes place not in readiness to resume work following external concessions and this or that modification to working conditions, but in the determination to resume only a wholly transformed work, no longer enforced by the state. I think I, I want to pause here to highlight two things. Um, the first being that rather than making a particular demand, the satisfaction of which would halt the strike, which is the model of the political general strike, the proletarian general strike makes an absolute demand for the complete transformation of its working conditions. Which is to say also that Benjamin is reversing our received understanding of what would constitute violence. So a really important part of his analysis of the legal system is that in legitimating itself, the legal system also deems certain kinds of actions to be violent or to be illegitimate. And here Benjamin wants to say that a kind of strike that is seemingly in accordance with the law is itself a violent strike, whereas a strike that exceeds what the law permits would be nonviolent. So I have here um, as a heading on the slide, um, soyez réaliste, demandez l'impossible, or be realistic, demand the impossible, which was a slogan of the student movement in 1968. And I think it, it nicely captures this sense of an absolute demand that Benjamin is getting at and brings us a little bit closer to the problem of study and education that we're investigating. Now we're going to turn to um, the example of educative violence in the essay, um, which has received relatively little attention from scholars. Um, what Benjamin says more or less in passing is that educative violence is an example of what we've been calling sovereign violence or divine violence. This is that it acts outside the law and acts in such a way as to suspend or to annihilate the law. And I just want to, I guess, frame my intervention in the existing critical discourse in relation to two previous readings. As I said earlier, um, the notion of violence in this essay does not refer exclusively to physically violent deeds because it's translating a German term, um, Gewalt, which encompasses authority, force, and violence. So it's really striking then that Axel Honneth, um, who is the director of the third generation of the Frankfurt School, goes on to read this example of educative violence to which Benjamin alludes as referring to the natural right of the teacher to, um, to punish the student um, physically, so the, the, the right to corporal punishment. So this is not only a reduction of the range of connotations for Gewalt, to, to the literal deed of physical violence, but it also misses the reversal of agency that we've been looking at. 
um, because what Hanas is doing is also assuming that educative violence would be wielded by the teacher in the image of God. But for a reader who takes seriously Ganyan's involvement in the student movement, it seems far more plausible that educative violence would be wielded by the student, by the person who has the least power and the least authority within the university. This is something that Matthew Charles, who's um, also affiliated with the Frankfurt School, does pick up on in his reading. For Charles, um, educative violence would describe an interpersonal ethics that's grounded in a pedagogical relation in which the authority of the teacher does not involve violent mastery over the student. He, he wants to say that the crucial element of educative violence is a mutual transformation of student and teacher that becomes possible in mastery over the medium of education. I think this is more satisfying, but still not quite right, because in speaking exclusively about a nonviolent relation between teacher and student, Charles abstracts from the institutional context in which pedagogy would be happening. And so he neglects the ongoing implication of this pedagogical relation in the reproduction of power and legitimation of knowledge by the state university. So my view is that it's not possible to extract an ethics of nonviolence from Benjamin's essay. Um, I want to say that there is like an irreducible moment of violence in intellectual work and in cultural life that Honeth and Charles are alighting and that at best scholarship and study can negotiate the relation to the violence that makes them possible. So I now want to talk a little bit about how these kinds of violence we've been thinking about might look in the university. To do that, I want to track um, the place of students in the institution. So Benjamin is quite clear in the life of students that students like, have no official status in the university, that the, state's alliance, the university's alliance with the state um, involves um, a relation between educational authorities appointed by the state and civil servants in which students have like, no place and no voice. And then he highlights two aspects of student life that are excluded from the university understood in this way. The first um, is ba basically a set of certain styles of thinking. So styles of thinking that encompass radical doubt, fundamental critique, and a kind of existential commitment to reconstruction um, in one's own life and in relation to the institution. And the second will be direct or immediate cre creativity understood as communal activity. The claim here is that the state university organizes itself around the professionalization of students. Um, and so kind of is directing them towards a predetermined end, um, which takes the shape of the profession that their studies allow, and generally also comes with a kind of nuclear family structure so in the face of this status quo and the forms of living and thinking that it excludes, um, Benjamin wants to make the claim that the kind of the originary power of students in the university has been, has been forgotten or has been um, in some ways effaced. And so his, his claim is that the ground of the, organi the, ground of the university's organization is not, um, I guess, it, it is neither um, philosophical rationality nor the unity of knowledge, but is the productive capacity of the student body. Um, and he understands this productivity in and through a rethinking of the pedagogical relation. So instead of like pedagogy being about the teacher dispensing their expert knowledge to the student, pedagogy happens in the moment that the student begins to teach. So the point here is that students are sort of simultaneously and, independent and interdependently teachers and learners. So the ethification of teaching, albeit in forms that are quite different from those current today, is an imperative for any authentic learning. The student should be an active producer, philosopher, and teacher all in one. So what I want to highlight here is that Benjamin is exploiting a contradiction imminent to the university between the student's lack of official status and their, their founding productivity or their founding autonomy. Um, its analysis proceeds by trying to heighten this contradiction and thus it offers us resources for thinking about a tension between the forces of production and the relations of production in the university. And for those of you in the interdisciplinary seminar, I asked you to look at a short piece by Silvia Federici um, on the university as 
as a knowledge commons, or in fact as not a knowledge commons. Um, and I'm not an expert in either social production theory or Marxist feminism, but I think the reading is helpful for understanding the way in which the university's legitimation of knowledge functions by way of enclosure, and the way in which by any means thinking of the role of students functions actually by way of allowing for their movement inside and outside the university. I'm just going to read this quote. The task of students is to rally around the university, which itself would be in a position to communicate the systematic state of knowledge, together with the cautious and precise but daring experiments with new methodologies. Students who conceive the role in this way would greatly resemble the amorphous waves of the people that surround the prince's palace, which serves as the place for perpetual intellectual revolution, a point from which new questions would be incubated in a more ambitious, less clear, less precise way, but perhaps with greater intuition. The creativity of students might then enable us to regard them as the great transformers whose task is to seize upon new ideas, which spring up sooner in art and society than in the university, and shape them into scientific questions under the guidance of the philosophical disposition. So, in terms of the logic of production here, it's really important that society and the arts are the origin of ideas, and what the university allows students to do is to like, give, give a methodology or give a systematic shape to these ideas by way of their philosophical disposition. This means that student life introduces other modes of thinking, creating, and living into a university that would otherwise consolidate national knowledge of the past as the settled possession of the ruling class. We can say also that they're occupying the position of the unconscious or the unthought in the organization of the university and that they therefore enable the eruption of social forces in it. The, the key point is that Benjamin is trying to emancipate the autonomous productivity of youth, and that he sees this as the fundamental task of education in and through which the institution itself can ultimately be radically transformed. Part of the question I want to ask today is how close Benjamin brings us to a notion of the university as a knowledge commons, and how distant we remain from its practical realization. Um, first of all, the way in which he speaks about like, the creativity of the student body, I think remains beholden to a kind of idealist model in which um, it's the productivity of the mind that would be the driving force. Um, so in terms of kind of the longer history of thinking about um, the role of philosophy in the university and the role of philosophy as having a kind of legitimating jurisdiction in the university, um, well, Benjamin will want to say that philosophy is not confined to a particular discipline and that anyone is in principle a student because there's a moment of study in all teaching and a moment of teaching in all learning, it's still the case that he sees a kind of philosophical rationality as being the site for, um, I guess, the, the renewal and the transformation of the tradition. Um, so in as much as he's picking up on the thematic of like transcendental reflection on um, like the conditions of possibility for thinking. Um, he is, I think, not simply trying to justify academic knowledge, but he's rather thinking about what makes academic knowledge possible in terms of measuring a gap between academic knowledge and what would be a just form of knowledge. But he's also not really taking He's not necessarily taking into account um, the material and the historical conditions for that kind of thinking. In closing, then, I want to turn to, I, I want to juxtapose, I guess, his description of the intergenerational relation in 1915 with his description of it in 1929 um, in a communist pedagogy. Um, and then th the heading here is um, the title of Bill 124, which some of you are probably aware of, um, which is a bill that the Ontario Provincial Legislature recently passed. What it does is to um, cap the gains from collective bargaining to 1% per year. So it doesn't, it doesn't technically remove the right to strike or the right to collective bargaining, but it sets a kind of legal horizon to gains that can be made. Um, and what they've called it is the Protecting the Sustainable Public Sector for Future Generations Act. What I want us to think about is the way in which the category of youth 
unsettles um, the predetermined end of education. So Benjamin will characterize bourgeois educational theory in 1929 as combining a kind of a, a reliance on its insights about the nature of the child and its insights about what ideal citizenship would be. And so by thinking about these two poles of ethics, it elides um, youth as a time of transition between childhood and adulthood, and youth as a time of transition that could be a time of open-ended potentiality. So, I mean, Benjamin famously describes um, the historicist concept of time as empty, homogenous, and linear. And so for our purposes, I think it's quite instructive that what bourgeois educational theory does is essentially to posit education as an empty, continuous, linear progression from childhood to an adulthood understood as like profession, marriage, and family. So in the face of this eradication of youth, not so much as a chronological period, but as a capacity of the human being, um, Benjamin will assign critique to the task of liberating the future from its deformations in the present by an active cognition. Um, so in 1915, he wants to say, students are in fact not the younger generation, they are the aging generation. And that what's most challenging in the posture of study is to see people who are younger than you um, and to live with them and work with them and teach them and to recognize a kind of missed opportunity in your own past as a condition for the renewal of your future. This is an image from May 68. And over on the right, under the antiquities heading, it says, sur les pavés la plage, beneath the pavement, the beach. Um, or for our purposes, beneath the campus, the commons. And I just wanted to end with this image.